I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 2, Podcast I, Julius Caesar. To appreciate Shakespeare's tragedy of Julius Caesar, it is essential to be aware of the difference between Shakespeare's conception of monarchical government and our own. We have been trained to think of monarchs as synonymous with tyrants, and tyrant is what Cassius and other conspirators call Caesar in the play, for example at Act 1, Scene 3, Line 103. When Caesar is killed in Act 3, Scene 1, the assassin Cinna shouts at Line 78, Liberty! Freedom! Tyranny is dead! And at Line 110, Brutus shouts, Peace! Freedom! And Liberty! These cries tempt us to think of the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, liberty and equality. But in Shakespeare's hierarchical conception of the world, as I discussed in sessions 1 and 2 of chapter 7 in series 1, the overthrow of a rightful monarch meant not peace, freedom, and liberty, but civil war and chaos. Was then Caesar a rightful monarch? The historical Julius Caesar whom Shakespeare knew from Plutarch's Lives, in Thomas North's translation, was the man responsible for Rome's pivot from republic to empire. Though he never officially ruled as monarch, he is considered the founder of the Roman Empire, responsible for the shift in power from senate to emperor consolidated by his heir, Octavius, who became Caesar Augustus. Shakespeare had to remain true to the historical facts of Caesar's life and death, which were known to all educated members of his audience. However, embedded in the cultural inheritance of Shakespeare's time were two different attitudes toward the same historical facts. Some in Shakespeare's audience admired Caesar and disapproved of the conspiracy against him as treachery. Some disapproved of Caesar and admired the conspirators as liberators. The pro-Caesar attitude was founded on the traditional medieval picture of the world, which was hierarchical and monarchist. It focused on Caesar's historical role rather than on his particular human qualities. It is best represented by the complex treatment of Caesar in the Inferno of Dante. Dorothy Sayers writes, Dante's attitude to Julius Caesar is ambivalent. Personally, as a pagan, Julius is in limbo, Canto 4, line 123. Politically, his rise to power involved the making of civil war, and Curio, who advised him to cross the Rubicon, is in the eighth circle of hell, Canto 28, lines 97 to 102. And note. But although Julius was never actually emperor, he was the founder of the Roman Empire, and by his function, therefore, he images that institution which, in Dante's view, was divinely appointed to govern the world. Thus Brutus and Cassius, by their breach of sworn allegiance to Caesar, were traitors to the empire, i.e., to world order. Consequently, just as Judas Iscariot figures treason against God, so Brutus and Cassius figure treason against man in society. Or we may say that we have here the images of treason against the divine and the secular government of the world. Like Dante, Shakespeare thought of Julius Caesar as the embodiment of the Roman Empire, which had been prepared by God to serve as the secular order governing most of the known world, subduing the space in which Christianity and its church could spread the word of universal salvation. As head of the empire, the emperor was ordained by God to rule in the worldly realm, as Christ ruled in the spiritual. To assassinate Caesar, then, no matter how noble-sounding the motives, was treachery, the results of which would be mob rule and civil war until the emperor's seat was occupied again. As Sayers points out, the assassins were held to be world historical traitors, parallel in the secular realm to Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Christ. The contrary view, which was humanist, focused on Caesar's human qualities and particularly his faults, especially his ambition. 
It was shared by Renaissance writers like Marlowe and Johnson, who were influenced by Cicero and, in some cases, by Lucan's Pharsalia. In his essay on cruelty, Book II, Essay 11, Montaigne notes Caesar's somewhat lesser cruelty than that of others in punishing his captive enemies, and in his story of Spurina, Book II, Essay 33, Montaigne lists Caesar's various amorous conquests in criticizing his insatiable lust. Others describe Caesar's physical defects. In this view, Caesar's ambition threatened a new tyranny over the ancient order of the Roman Republic. His defeat of Pompey, the Senate's representative, in a civil war called forth the heroic conspirators to risk their lives to defend the Republic against the potential tyrant. As he so often does, Shakespeare in his Julius Caesar is able to have it both ways, up to a point. The play imports a good deal from the humanist characterization of Caesar as fallible man and of the conspirators as brave. At the same time, the play holds firmly to the hierarchical view that the assassination of Caesar was a great calamity. One way Shakespeare manages to include both attitudes is by distinguishing between the man Caesar and the spirit of Caesar. The man Caesar is a tragic character in the play. From the humanist tradition, Shakespeare imports Caesar's various human frailties. As we hear from Cassius in Act 1, Scene 2, though Caesar is brave, he once nearly drowned in a river until Cassius saved him, lines 111 to 115. Caesar shook with ague, lines 119 to 28. He is deaf in one ear, line 213. He has the falling sickness, that is, epilepsy, line 254. In Act 2, Scene 2, we find that Caesar is subject to flattery, lines 70 to 107, that he is temporarily subject to the apparent superstitions of his wife, lines 75 to 82, that though he has good reason, by virtue of his military conquest, to be proud, his pride is extreme and intemperate, lines 44 to 45, and Act 3, Scene 1, lines 60 to 70, and line 74. In As You Like It, at Act 5, Scene 2, lines 31 to 32, Rosalind calls Caesar's I came, I saw, and overcame a thrasonical brag. The word thrasonical comes from the braggart soldier Thraso in the play Eunicus, by the Roman playwright Terence. In his own play, Shakespeare suggests that Caesar dies partly because he will not heed the omens or stoop to moderating the senator's impression of his inflated image of himself. And, as the book of Proverbs has it in chapter 16, verse 18 of the Geneva Bible, pride goeth before destruction and an high mind before the fall. The King James Version has and an haughty spirit before a fall. At the same time, Shakespeare stresses that Caesar's greatness lies not in his mortal body, but in his spirit, what we might call his historical function as founder of the empire. At Act 2, Scene 1, lines 169 to 170, Brutus expresses the wish that the conspirators could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. Brutus's error lies precisely in his opposition to the spirit of Caesar, to the very principle of empire. Brutus thinks that by dismembering Caesar's body, he can obstruct Caesar's spirit. But the divine will as expressed in history dictated that Caesar's spirit could not be killed by the killing of his body. As proof, we see Caesar's ghost appearing to Brutus at Act 4, Scene 3, lines 275 to 286, and later Brutus reporting, at Act 5, Scene 5, lines 17 to 19, that The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night, at Sardis once, and this last night here in Philippi fields. Brutus finally realizes that, despite the killing of Caesar's body, the spirit of Caesar could not be assassinated. He says, at Act 5, Scene 3, lines 94 to 96, O Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. 
Antony has correctly predicted at Act 3, Scene 1, lines 270 to 275, that Caesar's spirit will be ranging for revenge, and, with a monarch's voice, cry havoc, and let slip the dogs of war, that this foul deed shall smell above the earth. As with the English kings of the history plays, Shakespeare founds his concept of the Roman emperor on the Renaissance idea of the two bodies of the king. The king is thought of as both the natural man and the embodiment of the body politic. I discuss this concept at some length in Session 2 of Chapter 7 in Series 1. In Caesar's case, the body politic is Rome, which, if not under the living Julius, then under his spirit abiding in Octavius, will fulfill its function in history not as a republic, but as an empire. That is the Caesar, the embodiment of Rome itself, that cannot be assassinated. Caesar's function as founder of the empire also accounts for all the portents that attend his death, in this play, as in Horatio's recounting of them in Hamlet, at Act 1, Scene 1, Lines 113 to 120 of that play, which was written shortly after this one. The earthquakes, lightning and thunder, ghosts and lion in the streets, men all in fire, Calpurnia's dream of Caesar's statue spouting blood, all foreshadow the disaster to Rome and its people and the chaos that will follow the assassination. These evils of chaos and civil war that in fact do follow end only with the rise of Octavius, upon whom the mantle of the spirit of Caesar comes to rest. Thus the assassination of the man Caesar does not kill the principle of empire, but only delays its fulfillment, and Shakespeare's characterizations of Brutus and Cassius confirm the characterization of the murder of Caesar as far more a crime than a noble act of heroism. Caesar is the pivotal figure of the play, but the greater tragedy is that of Brutus, for which that of Cassius is a foil. For the high-minded motives of Brutus and the ugly envy of Cassius spring also from the pride that goeth before destruction. It is these faults that blind them to the reality that is the spirit of Caesar. In Cassius especially, as in all the other conspirators but Brutus, it is not idealism but envy that is at work. Cassius cannot bear to serve a mere mortal like himself. Trying to seduce Brutus to his faction, Cassius says at Act 1, Scene 2, lines 95 to 131, I had as lief not be, as live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature, and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but nod on him. Ye gods, it doth amaze me a man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. The ironic effect of Cassius's envy of Caesar, built on the observation of Caesar's mortality, is that by his revolt Cassius immortalizes Caesar as emperor and himself as traitor. The greater tragedy of Brutus lies in the fact that he succumbs to pride not out of worldly self-aggrandizement, but both in spite and because of his nobility. That Brutus is noble is amply reinforced. In analyzing his own motives in Act 2, Scene 1, lines 11 to 12, and lines 166 to 180, Brutus says, I know no personal cause to spurn at him but for the general. Let's be sacrificers, but not butchers, Caius. Let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. This shall make our purposes necessary and not envious, which so appearing to the common eyes, we shall be called perjurers, not murderers. Mark Antony's eulogy of Brutus at Act 5, Scene 5, Line 68 to 72, confirms the nobility of Brutus. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He, only in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. Made one of them means joined them, counted as one of their number. But trusting to his own nobility, 
Brutus assumes in himself the authority to commit an obvious present crime in order to prevent a hypothetical future evil. Afraid that Caesar will later turn tyrant, Brutus turns tyrant to Caesar. In a sense, Brutus becomes a de facto moral emperor in deciding to execute the would-be political emperor. Where Caesar ignores the soothsayer, who can see into the future, Brutus presumes that he himself can see into the future when he cannot. His motives, it is true, were the general welfare rather than personal animus or gain, but the conviction that his principled Roman nobility gave him the right or duty to betray his friend and to murder the greatest man of the age, leaving Rome subject to no authority but that of the mob, was a monumental error, of the kind against which Messala, later at Act 5, Scene 3, Line 67 to 71, cries out, O oh, hateful error! Melancholy's child, why dost thou show to the apt thoughts of men the things that are not? O oh, error, soon conceived, thou never comest unto a happy birth, but killst the mother that engendered thee. The error of Brutus is to trust to his own noble judgment in performing an act of supreme treachery. He uses his idealistic opinion of himself to justify overruling every practical suggestion of the less honorable but more savvy Cassius. It is that same idealistic opinion of his noble self that, at Act 2, Scene 1, Line 34, Brutus uses to justify his decision to overrule Caesar's greatness and his destiny, that is, reality, by killing Caesar in the shell. The error is confirmed when Shakespeare shows us Brutus a few lines later at lines 63 to 69, in rebellion against himself, the inner chaos prefiguring the outer. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, the state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. This inner chaos, like the secrecy of the conspirators, like the metaphysical portents, reinforces the essential error in the enterprise. Shakespeare will, a few years later, portray again this relation of inner chaos to outer in the tragedies of Othello and Macbeth. That Brutus experiences the wrongness of insurrection within himself ought to have warned him away from the conspiracy. But Brutus proves to be as great a believer in his own infallibility as Caesar is in his. The rebellion within Brutus is extended to his noble wife Portia whose own father, Cato of Utica, fought Caesar with Pompey and chose to commit suicide rather than to live under tyranny when Caesar won. Portia observes correctly about Brutus at Act 2, Scene 1, Line 268, that you have some sick offense within your mind, and she wants him to share it with her. Proclaiming at Line 299 her own great Roman virtue of constancy, meaning courage and firmness of mind, she prevails. Brutus promises to share the secret of the conspiracy with her. By the time we next see her, in Act 2, Scene 4, she knows that secret. And knowing it, she too is now divided within herself. She cannot focus on her instructions to the servant Lucius, lines 1 through 12. She hears the non-existent noise of the bustling rumors like a fray, lines 16 to 18. Aside at lines 6 to 9, she tries to reinforce her fortitude for fear of blabbing. O oh, constancy, be strong upon my side. Set a huge mountain tween my heart and tongue. I have a man's mind, but a woman's might. A few lines later, at lines 42 to 43, she fears she has inadvertently given the plot away to Lucius and tries to correct it with, Brutus hath a suit that Caesar will not grant, and then says, Oh, I grow faint. Finally, at line 45, she participates in the conspiratorial hypocrisy by telling Lucius to say I am Mary. In short, her inner life, because she is now a sharer in the plot, becomes chaotic, like that of Brutus, about whom she speaks more truly than she means in saying to Lucius at line 14 that Brutus went sickly forth to the capital. 
Portia being Brutus's other half, her inner conflict, depicted as a kind of sickness, is parallel to his, and her end in suicide, reported at Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 155 to 156, prefigures his. Though Mark Antony is temporarily on the right side of history in this play, he and his errors, too, are instruments of the invisible divine disposition of historical events. His actions are essential to the triumph of the spirit of Caesar, but like those of the conspirators, his character is compromised. Brutus imagines at Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 182 to 183, that Antony can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. This is another error of judgment. Cassius is more astute, saying in lines 157 to 160, We shall find of him, meaning Antony, a shrewd contriver, and you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all. Antony's shrewdness is then demonstrated by his pose of humility to the assassins in Act 3, Scene 1, and his effective speeches in Act 3, Scene 2. But though Antony's performance to the crowd furthers the project of Caesar's revenge, Shakespeare's audience would be highly unlikely to approve of such exhortation of mobs to mutiny and violence. Antony is thus a vehicle not only of Caesar's revenge, but of the punishment of Rome for the conspiracy. Antony's later conflict with the heir apparent Octavius about the disposition of their battle forces foreshadows what we know will be Antony's own tragic fate, self-immolation in the love of Cleopatra and a war against Octavius by whom he will ultimately be defeated. Octavius, both here and in the later play Antony and Cleopatra, is not a particularly sympathetic character. He is cool, serious, practical, and determined. But it is not his function as a character to be beloved. He is no Christian prince like Prince Hal in the Second History Tetralogy. Rather, in Octavius we find the greatness of Caesar reanimated without the boasting. In Act 4, Scene 3, Brutus and Cassius quarrel with one another. In Act 4, Scene 1 and Act 5, Scene 1, Mark Antony almost quarrels with Octavius. But Octavius shows himself to be above that kind of fray, his higher function evident in his Saturnine character. His key line at Act 5, Scene 1, Line 20, when Antony asks, Why do you cross me in this exigent? is, I do not cross you, but I will do so. Crossing Mark Antony is beneath Octavius. He will do as he pleases, with minimal concern for Mark Antony and his opinions. His self-confidence, like Caesar's but without the boasting, is a revelation of his destined function. As Augustus Caesar, he will make of Rome the empire for which Julius Caesar prepared the way. Now here are two key lines. 1. At Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 28-34, to 34, Brutus says, And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is, augmented, would run to these and these extremities, and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which, hatched, would as his kind grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. Color means excuse, justification, pretext, a figurative use from the sense battle flag. The whole speech is expressed in hypotheticals. Being crowned might change his nature, line 13. He may do danger, line 17. So Caesar may, line 27. Brutus is acknowledging that nothing Caesar is or has yet done justifies the assassination. He fashions his thinking to justify killing the real Caesar as a preventive measure based on the conjectures of his own imagination. 2. At Act 3, Scene 1, line 77, Caesar says, Et tu, Brute? Then fall, Caesar. The Latin means, You too, Brutus? Caesar dies of his multiple stab wounds only when he recognizes that the noblest Roman of them all has turned against him.
Now here's one specific note to help you in your reading. At Act 2, Scene 1, Line 261, Portia says, Is Brutus sick, and is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humors of the dank morning? The word physical here means healthful. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.